a very good afternoon to you all. It's my privilege to extend a warm welcome to more than 1,200 registered participants from different parts of the globe. Participants from about 10 different countries are here with us now, virtually. Today is indeed very special, as along with students from 50 different colleges and universities, for the first time, we have with us students from 70 different schools, Pan-India. Shurendranath College is honored to have you all in this outreach program, a new view of the solar system organized by Department of Physics, funded by Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, under the DBT Star College Strengthening Scheme. Without much ado, I would now request our Honorable Principal, Dr. Indronil Kaur, to introduce our speaker and inaugurate the program. Over to you, sir, Dr. Indronil Kaur. Thank you, Aditi. Good, a very good afternoon to everybody present in this webinar platform today. It is an absolute privilege for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Devi Prashad Duari. Dr. Duari completed his BSc and MSc in physics from Jadavpur University. He received his PhD in astrophysics from Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, IUCAA, and Pune, under the guidance of famous astrophysicist, Professor Jayant Narlikar. Since then, Dr. Duari has been affiliated to, a, to quite a few famous institutes in India, as well as in abroad. To mention some, she was an assistant professor at Institute for Advanced Studies in Basic Sciences, Iran. She was also a faculty at University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, UK. Currently, he is the Director of Research and Academics, MP Birla Institute of Fundamental Research, Calcutta. Dr. Duari received many prestigious awards in his career, including the Ravindra Puraskar by the Government of West Bengal and the Honorary DSC degree. To date, he continues to be associated with several eminent organizations such as Royal Astronomical Society, International Astronomical Union. Aside from his talents and advocacies, Dr. Duari is also a distinguished author of a number of popular books and papers in international and national journals. In short, I must say that if you, if you're a student of a school, or college wants to pursue your career in science, we will get to know him at some point of your journey. He is energetic and passion towards educating young minds. Seem to be known, it, it has no bounds at all. He has delivered around 1450 lectures at different schools, colleges, universities, science workshop, and also given 350 live television in interviews. A few of them was in our institute also. This alone says that he really needs no introduction. So I'm not going to prolong the introduction by saying any more. Today, in this outreach webinar, he is going to talk about a new view of the solar system. As I said, I am very happy to hand over the mic to Dr. Duari. Dr. Duari, please. It's a wonderful feeling. Good afternoon to every participant and especially the organizers of this fantastic webinar approach. Because this effort is very close to my heart. Because it is not only just for college students of a particular college, but Shurendranath College proudly has been fully successful in reaching out to almost all corners of academic institutes, not only in India, but also abroad, as I've just heard. And the introduction given by Professor Kaur, I'm humble, and it's my privilege to be present here today. 
what i hope is that that today our discussion especially amidst this picture of doom and gloom that we all are facing we all are feeling some sort of apprehension in our present scenario that will this lecture will make the young minds think a little more about our bigger perspective bigger mindset bigger environment and will give us the philosophical and psychological strength to fight the present situation so this is my wish now without wasting much time once again thanking every organizing person for this confer for this webinar and every participant be on live streaming on youtube or the 500 but this is for the first time i am seeing that out of 500 registered people all 500 has joined and that is a wonderful feeling in my heart so today i will now start sharing now the presentation which i have prepared for this lecture the name of this lecture the title is a new view of the solar system sky has always been a wonder to us there are so many questions and queries starting from our young age probably in our parents lap when we looked into the sky we used to hear a lot of stories lot of ideas lot of concept about the skies but as we grew up we realized that sky is one of the ultimate place for our human minds to dwell upon for our human minds to try to find the truth for nature about nature and that is the reason over millennia sky has played a tremendously important role in the minds of scientists philosopher scientific minded people and even general public and that is the reason also the subject of astronomy has become so important it's a vast vast subject and it is almost impossible to get the feeling the 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 nuances of the subject in a matter of one hour or one hour 10 minutes 15 minutes so i decided to talk about an subject area which most of us has been taught in our school days about the solar system a class 6 or 7 book nowadays will give you 10 to 15 pages of our solar system so most of us think that we know about it but what about it what are the new findings what are the new realization coming out of knowledge of our neighborhood about the solar system so in that respect let us begin our journey to this solar system a new view thousands of years back when our ancestors used to look into the sky they used to wonder what is sky where is sky what are those objects the lighted dots that we call stars and is there any connection between the star and the earth with these set of questions and queries the subject of astronomy was born so astronomy can be considered as one of the oldest subject that human minds have dwelt upon at the same time given the huge number of news item that you regularly get to see in television channels and newspapers we get an idea that it is also one of the most happening subject in the recent times astronomy as a subject has the power it can tell us what was the physical situation in this particular region that we lived millions of years back at the same time it can give us a hint what can be the situation in this region millions of years later so spanning a vast expanse of space and time the subject that deals is astronomy and scientists all over the world are realizing that soon the 21st century is going to be called the century for astronomy and astrophysics as a result for the last 2 3 decades a tremendous amount of spurt of activities is going on in every country almost developing under developed fully developed every country they're trying to build newer and newer facilities bigger and bigger telescopes which will try to make us realize what lies at the deepest part of the cosmos because the scientists have realized that to understand nature in its fullest content one has to go deeper into it 
And if we, if we want to go deeper in the microcosm of a particle world, you have to go to the biggest arena of science of nature that is the cosmos itself. And just to give you an example, as I was talking about the different efforts, see, for example, in this inhospitable terrain in the Pyrenees mountain of France, they have built this observatory called Pic du Midi. The cost of building this observatory was $300 million. One of the smallest Hawaiian archipelago island called Mauna Kea. On top of Mauna Kea, six countries have created nine observatories. The smallest one cost is around $500 million. So you could imagine what a tremendous amount of effort in terms of manpower, resources, finance is going on to understand the sky. And not only, and not only it is on the optical wavelength, in the radio wavelength as well, because we know any object in the sky will radiate in all the spectrum of all the wavelength bands of electromagnetic spectrum. But because of the presence of the Earth's atmosphere, only two types of radiation, optical, visible light, and radio wavelengths can penetrate and come to the Earth. That is the reason to observe these cosmic objects. Huge radio antennas are being produced. This one in Germany, 100 meters in diameter, it gives you a concept of the gigantic instrument that has been built. But I think the young minds today listening to this webinar will be happy to know the largest telescope is not yet born. The largest telescope will probably start functioning from 2022. The name of this telescope is TMT, 30 meter telescope. A telescope with a 30 meter diameter mirror at the heart of it. The cost of building this telescope is so high. Five countries are collaborating to build this telescope. USA, Canada, Japan, China, and Australia, and India. The Indian government in 2014 has already declared that the Indian contribution for building this telescope will be close to around 1,700 crore rupees. So India is one of the next place of destination of excitement where studies, research work, and other observations are going to happen for the cosmos. Not only that, I think some of you have heard about this mega project called SCA, Square Kilometer Array. Mostly two countries, South Africa, where, where 200 dish antennas are going to get erected, and in Afri Australia, 1,30,000 small dipole antennas will be erected, and they will make a gigantic system to observe the deepest depth of the cosmos still yet discovered. And you'll be happy to know India is one of the prime associates of this car program. Not only that, we all know in 2016, around month of July, there was a fantastic news everywhere that in 1916, Albert Einstein gave a lot of theories of general theory of relativity. And out of that, they came, we came to understand that any two very heavy compact objects, if they're moving around each other in space, they will create a ripples in the space and time. These ripples, which will be called gravitational waves, will travel across the universe at the speed of light. And that predicted wave was actually discovered in 2016 using two fantastic facility in USA. It was called, the project was called LIGO, Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory. The first India international associate of LIGO is India. Down south, in southern India, they have already started building the Indigo project, Indian Gravitational Observatory. And it will be one of the proudest thing that India can boast of in the international arena of scientific, scientific people and scientific community. So with that tremendous legacy, as well as a fantastic future in India, let us start energizing our minds about the sky. Thousands of years back, when our ancestors used to look into the sky, they used to wonder what is the meaning behind those lighted dots we call stars. But they couldn't find a proper answer. But in their desperation, what they did, they chose different parts of the sky, identified closely spaced stars, joined those stars through straight lines, and created imaginary figures in their mind. 
each, the whole sky was divided into an 88 region, each region being governed by an imaginary figure, which we today call constellations or Taramandal. Today's generation may be thinking that these are all imaginary. Why should we know about them or their names and so on and so forth? But let me tell you, even today, they have not lost their physical relevance. For example, if you have gone for a hitchhiking trip, night has happened, moon is not there in the sky. You want to go in the southern direction, but which is the southern direction? If you happen to see the Shaptar Shimandal, seven stars, like a question mark called Big Deeper in Western parlance, take the last two stars, join them in your mind and produce it on the sky. It will create a great circle and that circle is called, and that, that star, it will create a hit upon a single star and that star is called the pole star. The moment you know, get to know the pole star, you know which is not southeastern west. So even today, these sort of knowledge actually helps us in our real life as well. Let us now talk about the earth and the sky surrounding it. Let us consider the earth and the center and the sky like the inside of a globe. Take the equator of the earth. In your mind, produce it onto the sky. On the sky, it will create a great circle. And let us call it the celestial equator. Now, you all know, earth is going around the sun once in 365.25 days continuously. But what appears to us, because sky is just a two-dimensional surface, and the position of the sun, sun to us is just a projection of sun on the two-dimensional surface. So what it appears to us, that as if, Sun is going round the earth once in one complete year. This apparent imaginary path of sun around the earth on the sky is called the ecliptic, loci of eclipses. Now again, in our childhood days, we have learned in our school that earth is going round the sun around an axis and it goes round itself once in 24 hours around another axis and these two axes are not parallel. They're inclined at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. But a lot of us, haven't paid that attention to understand that just because these two axes are parallel and not inclined, we people are sitting here today. There would have been no life if these two axes are parallel to each other. But I'll come to that. But because these two axes are inclined by 23 and a half degrees, these two imaginary planes, the blue colored celestial equatorial plane and the yellow colored ecliptic plane will intersect each other along a straight line. And the end points of the straight lines are of importance. The first end point is called, as you can see in the photograph, vernal point of vernal equinox. The word equinox means comes from Latin. It means equal nights. 22nd or 23rd of March, sun appears at this point. That day, it is exactly equal amount of daytime and nighttime for everybody around us. March, April, May, June, 21st or 22nd of June, Sun appears at the northernmost point of this ecliptic plane. That day for the northern hemisphere people, it is the longest day and the shortest night. 22nd of September, sun goes to the other extreme. Again, equal amount of daytime and nighttime. And 21st or 22nd of December, sun comes in the southernmost point of this ecliptic plane. And that day, at least for the northern hemisphere people, that is the shortest day and the longest night. So this continuous variation of nighttime and daytime occurs just because of this accidental tilt of 23 and a half degrees. Now let us talk about the sun, earth, and the moon. You will think that all this has been taught in our childhood days. So why should we think? Why should we again discuss about it? But if, if somebody asks you, can you please tell me what is the average speed of the earth around the sun? Most of us will try to scratch our head. 29.5 kilometer per second. Imagine a car moving 30 kilometers in one second. You'll say it's not possible, but you are forgetting you, me, 770 crore people, millions of other lives existing on the surface of the earth. Every second of our existence, we are moving at a velocity of 30 kilometers per second. If you even take the moon, it goes around the earth at a speed of 1.022 kilometer per second. That is tremendous, right? It's 86,400 kilometers per day. It will move because the speed is one kilometer per second. Seasons. It is because of this accidental tilt of 23 and a half degree seasons occurs. Because you see in this photograph, if you can see on the left-hand side of the sun, when Earth is around there, because of the tilt, sunlight is falling directly onto the Northern Hemisphere planting down to the south. 
it is summer in the north winter in the south because if sunlight falls directly onto a patch of land the average energy per unit area which will be absorbed and re-radiated will be more than an area where the sunlight is falling slantingly and as a result the temperature in the first case will be more than the second and that is the reason in this configuration it is summer in the north winter in the south six months later it is just the opposite now because of the tilt sunlight falling directly onto the southern hemisphere it is summer in the south winter in the north you may again ask me what is the big deal about it do you know if there were no change of seasons there would have been no ocean currents on our earth if there were no ocean currents on our earth there would have been no air currents in our atmosphere and if there are no air currents in our atmosphere clouds would not have born somewhere and gathered somewhere else and gave us rain and fresh water life would not have been possible because just after it was born it would have been a barren desert so that you and me exist is because of this accidental tilt isn't it an accident a chance happening eclipse by now most of you know what is an eclipse it is a special configuration of sun moon and earth coming in a straight line on the same plane as a result moon blocks the sun and we get a total solar eclipse right lot of taboos lot of ideas concept which makes us afraid are still around but we know it's a natural phenomena just to give you an example taken from space this wonderful picture of the solar eclipse where you can see the shadow of the moon falling on the patch of the globe and people staying on that patch at that point of time will see a total solar eclipse a fantastic image again as the earth is spinning see the shadow of the moon as it crosses the globe of the earth which is called the path of total solar eclipse at times it can be almost 900 to 1000 kilometers in, in in thickness and we all know just recently just 10 12 days 15 days back we had a fantastic annular eclipse seen mostly from a small swath of land in the northern part of india this was from dehradun where the moon is not able to cover up the full sun as a reason a ring of light a ring of fire an annular region called an annular solar eclipse was seen it was during an eclipse scientists discovered the sun as a as a different avatar as a new avatar they found out from the surface of the sun milky white radiation is coming out which cannot be seen on other times when they asked themselves a the question what is causing this they were amazed with the answer they found out from the surface of the sun every second every second 16 lakh tons of charged particles are coming out these charged particles as they move through the magnetic field of the sun they produce this milky white radiation the average velocity of these charged particles are 450 km per second with that speed they have enough momentum enough energy if they hit any atom or molecule instantaneously they will break apart that means if i stop this lecture go out and stand on the sun the charged particle coming from the surface of the sun the moment they hit my body they will instantaneously my body will evaporate but i am alive how i will come to you now tides a very very important issue because it is just because of the tides lives on land evolved and thrived we have arrived from monkeys but the monkeys of the other primates or the other species they originated because tides carry the multicellular organisms every day to the washed ashore to the shore and from their life happened on land so if i ask you why does tide occur most of you know the answer tide occurs because moon is attracting the water on the earth but to tell you the truth sun is attracting earth 173 times more than the moon does then why do you only say moon which is most important the answer is tide is not a force it is rather a resultant of quite a number of force over unit distance or what is known as force derivative effectively the formula is m1 m2 by r cube and that is the reason since moon is still like 84000 kilometers away and sun is 15 crore kilometers away moon wins but a lot of our teachers have failed to tell us in our childhood days sun also attracts the water on the earth do you know how much 47% than the moon does now let me ask you a question only on one geographical region on earth will face the moon once in 24 hours in the in the course of its spinning then why is it that 
in a particular day, there are two high tides. The reason is that tide on Earth is an interplay, interaction between two forces. The force of gravity towards the moon and the centrifugal force faced by the Earth because the centripetal force is being faced by the moon, which is going around the Earth. So the side which is facing the moon, the gravitational force wins. Water bulges in this direction. The side which is antipodal, 180 degree away on the other side of the Earth, because there, increase of distance has made the gravitational force less than the centrifugal force. And again, water bulges out, but because of the centrifugal force that time. Amazing. Moon. Taken from the surface of the moon, Earth arising from the horizon. What is moon? According to the scientists, 452 crore years back, or 4.52 billion years back, <clears throat> a huge ball of rock, typically the size of today's Mars, came and slammed onto the Earth with such a force, <clears throat> huge amount of surface material got gouged up and was thrown up in space. It couldn't go away forever, but going to a very vast distance for millions of years, it it condensed, coalesced, and ultimately gave birth to our moon. Our moon was formed out of a collision on Earth. This theory goes by the name, the collision ejection theory. Though there are other theories, but most of the scientists now believe in the theory of the moon's origin as the collision and ejection process. I think it is now time, high time for us, to begin our journey out of the earthly bounds into space and time. Why I'm using the word time? Because in 1905, Albert Einstein gave a lot of theories about the special theory of relativity. I'm not going to that, but that has given us the new ideas, the concepts that that time, that light travels at a constant speed in a medium and the velocity of light is still a kilometer per second. The distance from sun to earth is 15 crore kilometer. If I take the velocity of light as three like kilometers per second to a simple division, in your class six, seven textbook, you often find that the light takes 8.3 minutes to come from sun to earth. But what does it physically mean? Physically, it is amazing. That means that if you now go out and stand on the sun and look at the sun, you have to tell yourself the image of the sun that I'm seeing is the image as it was 8.3 minutes back. The closest star, to our solar system, Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away. If today, the evening, the night is clear, you can see the star and tell yourself, the star I'm seeing, it is the image of the star as it was 4.2 years back. So my friend, next time you don't have to go to the science city to spend 50 bucks and go into a time machine ride. In any clear night, go out into the open, tilt your head. The deeper you are looking, you are looking at your own past. We, we realize, don't realize that the moment you look into the sky, we are traveling in the past as a time travel. So the observation of night sky gives you the thrill, the excitement of not only looking into the dark depth of space, but also going back in time as well. The first stop of our journey is the solar system. This is the beautiful picture of all the main avatars, sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto has been kicked out. Sun. Sun is a ball of gas. Such of my friend tell me, if I take a football, pump in a lot of colored gas, cut open the football, with the gas remain like a ball, it will diffuse out into space. Then how come sun being a ball of gas is not diffusing out into space? According to the scientists, 460 crore years back, or 4.6 or billion years back, a huge cloud of gas and dust was floating in space. This cloud, in terms of number of particles, was made up of 91% hydrogen, 8% helium, and 1% rest other elements. The average temperature of this gas cloud was minus 240 degrees centigrade. At minus 240 degrees centigrade, out of the four fundamental forces of nature, only one type of force comes into play, and that is the force of self-gravity. The force of self-gravity will attract the periphery of this gas cloud towards the center. As the gas goes toward the center, the central density rises. As the density builds up, temperature rises. As the temperature rises, as the temperature rises, the pressure builds up. So pressure and temperature does an interplay and ultimately we reach a point where the temperature reaches to 1.5 crore. 
at that temperature at that temperature what happens four hydrogen nuclei four protons as if they come together fuse together and produce a helium nucleus this thermonuclear fusion reaction of four hydrogen nuclei coming and fusing together to a helium nucleus is very important it produces huge amount of energy on earth our scientists have been able to perform this experiment but they cannot control it that's the reason they use it to explode it as a hydrogen bomb <clears throat> but inside the sun in a regulated manner in a very regulated manner when we say that the reaction is going on inside the sun we have to understand that the huge amount of energy tries to come out from the central region and as it tries to come out in the central region uh, it, it produces a back, back pressure and this back pressure it opposes the inward front force of gravity excuse me for a moment don't touch it don't touch it just bring it here yeah sorry sorry actually somebody has come from my office so i had to talk to him okay and this back pressure when it when it balances the inward force of gravity sun being a ball of gas remains hanging there for millions of years imagine these two balancing forces just creates the sun that we see and and the energy that is produced to sustain our life it's an amazing amazing happening how did the solar system happen according to the scientist it was a huge cloud of gas and dust floating in space and 460 million 460 crore years back and it has a small spin so as as the earth as the sun was getting born out of this disk of gas and dust at the center of the disk in the outer periphery where the temperature is less gas and dust condensed coagulated coalesced and has given birth to our planetary system it's an amazing amazing story if i now bring down the sun from the sky cut it open like a watermelon you will see inside there are three regions one the very central part where the average temperature is 1.5 crore degree centigrade is called the core then the energy that is produced over a huge volume it freely flows this region is called the radiative zone and then sun is very funny looking from the surface till a depth of 950 sometimes 800 kilometers columns of gas pillars of gas stacked one after another heat coming from inside hits the bottom layer of the gas pillar as gas when it is heated when it is heated it will rise up comes to the surface deposits the heat as sunlight and becoming cold goes down like a fountain and continuously raises the heat from inside this is called the convective zone so you see it's a very structured picture inside sun not only sun in any star but in different stars these different zones are of different varying thickness depending upon the mass of the star and the energy generation mechanism if i take the outside outside sun is again divided into three region the surface of the sun that you get to see in early morning or evening the red disk is called the photosphere over the photosphere in a very thin layer exquisitely pink colored gas can be seen and that is called the chromosphere and over the chromosphere thousands and hundreds of kilometers away a uh, milky white radiation called corona nothing to do with corona virus the word corona comes from latin it means crown as if sun is wearing a crown we want to see how the sun looks like amazing this sort of sketchy mottled surface if you look closely easily each is like a beehive shell right each is a column of gas as the heat is coming from inside it looks dark it looks bright but the moment the it comes and gets dissipated goes down the gas goes down it is typically dark because the te temperature the heat is missing the size of each of these cells is 950 to 1000 kilometers in diameter this is an exquisitely beautiful picture of the chromosphere taken during a total solar eclipse as the disk of the sun get covered you can see spikes of gas called spicules from the photospheric region and this is called chromosphere and the 
ever beautiful picture of the corona. Absolutely true, beautiful picture, the milky white radiation because of the charged particle coming out in the magnetic field of the sun. Sun sometimes becomes very active. You get to see black splotches on the surface of the sun. Sometimes one, sometimes 10, 20 in a group. They are called sunspot. What are they? The surface temperature of sun. The surface temperature of sun is around 5,600 degrees centigrade. At 5,600 degrees centigrade, gas cannot remain as gas. It becomes plasma. Plasma has a property. Whenever there is a magnetic field, whenever there is a magnetic field, there is the plasma tries to get deflected from it. On the surface of the sun, randomly very small patches of magnetic field occurs. And a column of plasma, when it tries to bring the heat from inside, if it realizes that, that there is a magnetic field over the region, it will not come out straight. It will take the heat away from different directions. No heat will come out from that region and it will be looking pitch dark. So sunspots are signatures of magnetic activity on the surface of the sun. This is a wonderful tech picture taken by Solar Dynamical Observatory costing around $1.2 billion. And it tells us though you think that the sun looks like an egg yolk, but there are tremendous amount of, ex amount of explosion happening every second on the surface of the sun. Thousands of tons of gas are getting thrown off from the surface, reaching a height of 10 to 15 to 20,000 kilometers, making big arches and loops falling back onto the surface. Sometimes they're getting thrown up with such a force, they get detached from the surface of the sun and flow past the whole solar system like a solar wind or a solar storm sometimes if the speed is much more than that. Just imagine this picture. Taken in 2015, this huge arch of gas coming out and falling back. Do you know what is the size of this cavity? The size of this cavity is such, three earths can go side by side inside this region. So this is an amazing structure. And I told you this charged particle, if they come and hit the earth, anything they will hit within instantaneously, they will get evaporated. Why you are alive? Because of another accident, another chance happening. By chance, by accident, by design, earth behaves like a bar magnet. Around the earth, like a peels of an orange, there is an invisible magnetic shield this charged particle, they come and slam onto the magnetic shield, cannot enter, flow past the earth, and we think we are the king and queen of ourselves. It's an amazing feeling, right? But in the north and south magnetic polar region, because of a gap, they, these charged particles, they can enter this through this gap and interact with the air molecules in the atmosphere before hitting the ground. And what we get to see, aurorae, aurora borealis in northern hemisphere, aurora australis in southern hemisphere. One of the beautiful pictures in my inventory, a picture taken almost some 15 years back when I was in the northernmost part of Norway, this beautiful picture of Aurora Borealis. And that reminds us that sun is interacting with the earth every second of our existence. Not only that, when there is a solar storm, it can really, really disturb the geomagnetic field, the ionosphere, which can have tremendous effect on the telecommunication linkage on the satellite communications and on the satellite electronics as well. So sun can become very disruptive as well. And that is the reason Parker Solar Probe has been sent. And now, by now it has made quite some number of close approaches to the coronal region to find out the structure and the properties of the corona. It is now time to talk about the other objects in the solar system. According to the scientist, 460 crore years from the disk of gas and dust, our sun was getting born. In the other outer region, where the temperature is less, gas and dust condensed, coagulated, coalesced, and gave birth to very hot spherical objects. For millions of years, they dissipated away the heat, and at least the first four, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, became rocky and terrestrial, whereas the other four, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, are mostly made up of gas. This is a collage of true, all true color pictures of planets. Here, I'm not going to discuss each of them because there is not enough time, but I will talk, tell only one or two. For example, Mars. For the last 15, 20 years, Mars has played a tremendously important role in public mind through any media, television, newspapers, radio, everywhere. Why? Because seeing this picture in 2002, taken in 2002, in the polar region, they have found white sediments. 
According to the scientists, this white sediment can be a mixture of water ice, ammonia ice, and dry ice, carbon dioxide ice. According to them, even if a part of it is water ice, maybe liquid water is to flow on the surface of the Mars millions of years back. And liquid water on Earth is synonymous with life. So was there life on Mars? Is there still life? It's a big question. And when they could, they could see these sort of geological, geomorphological structures, as if liquid water has cut, cut through mountainous region, but there is no liquid water for millions of years on the surface. So 2008, Phoenix landed onto Mars among a lot of instrument, it had a robotic arm, which is supposed to scratch a little bit of the Martian surface and see whether below the surface there, any, there is any liquid ice or liquid water or water ice. Very rare photograph. On the 20th day of operation, as they scratched a little, they found this whitish sediment. You see these three pebbles over here? After four days, not to be seen. This is probably for the first time the human civilization have found the proof of water ice outside the boundary of Earth. And the next picture is so amazing. It has not yet been fully published by NASA publicly because you see this is the wall of a crater and you see these black streaks. Yes, they are actually liquid water found to be floating on the surface during the summer season on Mars. And that is the reason in 2012, Curiosity landed onto Mars. The first set of pictures it sent us is amazing dried up riverbeds, the one we get to see during summer times when we are traveling over Chotanagpur Plate or any arid region. Then pebbles, pebbles can come because only during water flow, the stones get smashed against each other and become smooth because of the flow in the water and we get pebbles on Mars. So definitely there was liquid water. And the whole, when the whole world was jumping up and down, suddenly in India in 2015, 15 August, we came to know that India is ready for a mission to Mars. Amazing statement. Throughout the world, people started laughing. Is India capable enough technologically to take that challenge? But amazingly, we know the story. 6th of December, 2013, sitting at a nose cone of a PSLV X-25 rocket, our Mangal Jan was sent onto space. And around nine months later, on 24th of September, 8.02 a.m., Mangal Jan was successfully injected in an orbit around Mars. It's a wonderful, wonderful achievement. Starting from 1964-65 onwards, 55 missions have happened to Mangal, to Mars. Never in the very first attempt any country has achieved success. And out of 54-55, only 22 have been successful. So that tells you, my young friends, how India is making deep strides, big strides in science, technology, especially space science in this case. The pictures taken by the Mangal John's camera, so fantastic from two-dimensional photograph, you can create three-dimensional topograph. It's an amazing thing. Saturn, the beautiful ring system, 384,000 kilometers wide, one to 100 kilometers in thickness. How big is it? If you take Earth in the ratio, proper ratio, Earth is a tiny part of the width of the Saturn's disk. And amazingly, it is made up of ice crystals and pebbles. How come ice crystals and pebbles is keeping their shape and size and going round Saturn is a big question. And this picture, I think, is now almost viral in, in internet, the pale blue dot, taken by the Cassini spacecraft and the Voyager also earlier. When you look from the Saturn's ring aspect, Earth looks like a dot. And you have to say, if somebody asks you, who are you? I am one of the 770 crore human beings and among millions and billions of life on Earth. And what is Earth? That small dot. So it does fantastic thing to your ego that we are nothing. We are very small compared to the whole grand design of the cosmos. 1801, Italian astronomer Giuseppe Piazze discovered a piece of rock typically 900 kilometers in diameter orbiting between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter named it Sere. People thought a new planet has been discovered. But within a couple of years, three more, Pallas, Vesta, and Juno, each around 300 kilometers in diameter, were discovered in the same region. People knew, realized a new class of object is getting discovered. And starting from 1801 till today, thousands and thousands and thousands pieces of rock, 10, 20, 50, 50, 30 kilometers in size, is going around Mars and Jupiter. 
They are called asteroids. In this amazing picture, a represent, true representation by NASA, each green dot is a discovered asteroid. And each red dot is a special object called Apollo asteroid. Their speciality, their orbit intersects the orbit of Earth. That means Earth is going round on its own. They can come at the same point at the same time. The collision that may occur, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh of the Earth will blow apart. So that we are alive, that we are on Earth happily is another accident. And if you take the whole scheme of these asteroids going round, this is an amazing thing with two clumps of asteroids preceding and following Jupiter at the same distance. They are called frozen asteroids. They, they are fixed onto the orbit, onto their place, because of the interplay of gravitation between Sun and Jupiter. Basically, they are, in technical terms, they are the Lagrange point of Sun and Jupiter. In the recent times, especially in 2020, enormous number of news items. Asteroids are coming. They can smash onto the Earth. People beware how to do, what to do. My friends, most of the asteroids are not going to come. They, are, they, are not, they have not come. They have not collided. And they are not going to come and hit the Earth. Believe me. But scientists are aware of this, that there may be some potential danger. So different formulations are being used, using rockets with atom bombs, with sort of huge powerful bombs, which can go and explode near the asteroid, but that can cause a bigger damage. Something called gravity tractors, huge object, massive spaceships sent near the asteroid to slowly deviate its path using gravity and solar cell. As if attaching a cell, like a, like, like a boat, on an asteroid, so the solar wind, the charged particles that are coming out of the sun, will put enough pressure over a large area and slowly move the asteroid away from the path of collision with Earth. But none of them has been proven, but research is going on. This is one of the beautiful picture of an asteroid called Itakawa 8, photographed by a Japanese spacecraft called Hayabusa. And we, amazingly, it was found, it is not a solid object. It is sort of loose, loose gravels as if bound together by gravity. And one of the recent one, this is called Bennu. And you see it's spinning. This is a close photograph of that. And what happened just one year back? Amazing thing. A spacecraft called Hayabusa 2 actually landed onto an asteroid called Ryogu. And you can see in the bottom panel, the actual picture of the surface of Ryogu. It's an amazing thing. In the initial exp experiments, findings, scientists have realized there is a possibility of presence of huge number of mineral deposits on these asteroids, which can be used for the welfare of the human society. And that is the reason asteroid mining is becoming one of the important things for the astronomers, for the scientists. Beautiful picture. What is this? What are comets? According to the scientists, 460 crore years back, when from the disk of gas and dust, our sun was getting born. In the outer periphery where the temperature is less, gas and dust condensed, coagulated, and ultimately there was huge chunks of ice floating around. These chunks of ice, water ice, dry ice, ammonia ice, were colliding with each other and through soft coll collisions and regulation of ice process, they became bigger. When the typical size became 15 to 20 kilometers in diameter, they also started going around the sun in extremely elliptic orbit. In their elliptic orbit, as they came close to the sun by the sun's heat, the ice melted and created the million kilometers long tail. A comet head, or nucleus as it is called, is only 15 to 20 kilometers, where a tail is million kilometers long. Are there nine planets in the solar system? In 2003, 16th of November, a new object was found, discovered at the far flung outreaches of our solar system. Initially, the name was 2003 UB313. Now the official name is Eris. It was larger than Pluto. It takes 557 years to go around the sun once. So scientists started asking, what do you, what do you call this? Is it a planet? Because starting from 1930, when Pluto was discovered, scientists actually are not, were not happy to call Pluto a planet. 
because of quite a number of reasons. Pluto being small, it, it goes around the sun in an extremely eccentric orbit, unlike the other planetary systems. Most of the planets that go around the sun, in a, more or less in a plane, Pluto makes an angle of 70 degrees with the plane and goes around the sun. And Pluto's orbit takes it through a region which goes by the name Kuiper Belt from where the cometary heads originate. So Pluto was never sort of seriously considered as a planet. And this question became more critical when this object was discovered. And in 2006, astronomers sat together and decided to make a new definition of the solar system. According to them, solar system will be divided into two classes, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, these all we call classical planets. And a new class of objects were nomenclature, they were called dwarf planets. Pluto, the largest asteroid, Sere, and Eris. These three became the dwarf planet. But in 2015, two more dwarf planets were administered officially, Humia and Makemake. 2006, NASA started a slogan, follow the water. Is there any, any water outside the boundary of Earth? Mars is one candidate, but others, yes, Europa. One of the big moons of Jupiter, when they took a close-up photograph, they found these scratch marks. Theoreticians said that the surface of Europa is 15 to 20 kilometer thick water ice, but inside there is a huge reservoir of liquid water. This liquid water from inside as it putting a pressure on the outside, there are cracks developing. These cracks you can see as a scratch marks. This theory was more or less accepted when some years later, a spacecraft passing over another satellite of Saturn, Enceladus, would take this photograph. Plumes of hot water, hot water geysers coming out. And you can see the cracks. So an instrument has already been tested 2024, this cryobot instrument will be sent onto Europa and Enceladus. It's a huge drill machine with a powerful laser at the peak. As it will touch the surface of the ice, the laser will be switched on and through the heat, it, it will melt and 15 to 20 kilometers, it will drill through. The moment it touches liquid water, a small window opens up, a robot comes out and takes photograph and sends back to Earth. 2029, my friends, you'll come to know Earth is not the only place where life is there. There may be life everywhere in our solar system. It is now our time to go out of the solar system and almost coming to the end of this lecture. If you go out of the solar system, the sky, the actual color picture of the sky is amazing. You may say that where from you are getting this photograph, these dots of light as if the pinpricks of light on the sky are huge gas cloud. The, re the reason we do not get to see this is because of something called the perception of vision. Our eyesight has this. Within one tenth of a second, whatever amounts of light enters through our pupil and falls on the retina, the optic nerve immediately takes them to the back of our head in the optic lobe and creates an image. Our eyes cannot integrate light like a CCD chip. If our eyes were like a CCD chip, like a, our mobile camera, looking in a particular direction in the sky for 10, 15 hours, you'd have seen almost every dot in the sky is a star and there are huge gas cloud. The question comes, are all the stars like sun? The answer is yes and no. Why yes? Most of the stars are burning hydrogen to helium at the core. Why no? Because stars come with different initial masses, different surface temperature and different chemical composition. Stars with different stars come with varying masses starting from 0 0.08 times to 100 times the mass of sun where one solar mass is two followed by 30 zeros, two into 10 to the 30 kilograms. And in terms of temperature also, stars are divided into classification called O stars, B stars, A stars, F star, G star, and K star, and M star. Sun with a surface temperature of 5,600 degrees centigrade is a very mundane, ordinary type of G type of star. I'm not going to go much farther, but if I talk about the life and death of stars, Stars are born out of interstellar clouds of gas and dust. In the sky, there are regions where one can see these clouds and also the star formation processes. See for yourself the example. True color picture, amazing picture. This cloud can give rise to 1000 solar system. Don't mix it with the cloud in the atmosphere that you get to see on the earth. This is just the third planet and its atmosphere clouds over there. But this can give rise to 1000 solar system. See this. 
The upper greenish blue, it's for oxygen five, oxygen six. The middle region of the blue region is for neutral hydrogen. The yellow is for sulfur. The black at the down is for iron. The green on the right hand side down is for either zinc or molybdenum. And the white in the top corner, left hand corner is for titanium. How a picture tells a story. Don't forget to be an astrophysicist. You have to be tremendously clever because it is only the signal of light that comes to you from the sun or any, any other objects on the sky. You cannot bring down a star to your lab, cut it open, break it open, smell it, put chemicals and say, what is it? Just from the signal of light, you have to massage that light and bring out all the information. You have to be very clever upstairs. See for yourself. It's an amazing structure. You see these three small nodules at the top? Do you know the size of each of the nodule? Each nodule inside hides a fully formed stellar system like our solar system. Think of this. Universe is throwing a challenge to the human intellect. The bright and the young minds are challenged that if you want to know nature, if you want to discover that which never has been discovered, you, if you want to reach to a level where nobody has gone, you have to look into the cosmos. See for yourself. Pillars of creation, three columns of dust, dust moving very fast in the interstellar medium at the tip. The pressure that is generated is giving birth to stars almost regularly, stellar nurseries. And see for yourself the amazing beauty of nature. Millions of stars in a small region, what is known as a cluster, a closed cluster, a globular cluster. Amazing. How do the stars die in case of sun? Stars die differently depending upon their masses. In case of sun or sun or stars with initial mass one to eight times the mass of sun, after all the hydrogen at the core gets into helium, transformed to helium, the thermonuclear reaction stops, but gravity is there. So outside pressure stops, but internal pressure, internal gravity is there. So star shrinks. As it shrinks in the outer envelope, because of the constriction, the temperature rises and it rises to 1.5 crore, which is enough to fuse. Four hydrogen nuclei at the surface, near the surface region, and produce helium. Whereas at the central region, the helium core contracts, the temperature rises to around 10 crore degree centigrade, and three helium nuclei fuses to give rise to carbon. But when in the outer region, the hydrogen fuses to helium, because of the heat generated, the envelope becomes bigger. Gas, when it is heated, it expands. And it, the sun, the star becomes big and big and big. And ultimately, in case of sun, it will touch the orbit of Earth. It will, call, it will be called a red giant. Over millions of years, when the central region, helium to carbon production is going on, the outward region slowly become bigger and dissipates and creates a clouds-like structure called a planetary nebula. And inside that carbon, very hot, when all the helium goes into carbon, the initial mass being one to eight times the mass of sun is not enough to produce more pressure to increase the temperature to 100,000 crore degrees centigrade. As a result, carbon cannot fuse to anything else. The hot ball of carbon becomes very bright in the sky and is called a white dwarf. Over millions of years, this white dwarf continuously dissipate heat and becomes cold and becomes brown or black dwarf. And it ceases to exist from our eyesight, but it is not the end. The planetary nebula also diffuses out into the interstellar medium. But you tell me, my friend, inside the Earth, under tremendous amount of temperature and pressure, carbon gets transformed to what? Yes, diamond. So according to the scientists, theoretically, one can see, find, discover 10 to 15 kilometer piece of diamond floating in the sky. And that will be the remnant of a star like our sun. What a poetic end. Don't think this is a science fiction because these are the true pictures of planetary nebula. And almost 25 years back, me and my small group, we started doing a little bit of study of this. And we found out that this material of planetary nebula never comes out continuously. It comes out in pulses. Each pulse produces tremendous amount of shock. And that shock in a very complex mechanism can produce molecules. Though it is near a star, but molecules can be formed. And our work was supported by actual observation and people were happy with this 
almost new subject of astrochemistry. And these are the molecules which you predicted and was actually discovered. You see, most of them are organic molecules, thereby telling us the interstellar space, which looks dark and cold, is not just empty. Huge amount of chemistry is associated with the space. And from this understanding, in the last 20 years, when scientists have started asking the question, where from life originated on Earth? Where from life has come? The answer is, the first prebiotic material for life has come from space. Through collisions of meteorites, asteroids, comets, but it has seeded the life, the earth, with the prebiotic material of life. And with proper environment, proper chemistry, proper temperature, presence of water, life sprung up. And the new subject of astrobiology has thrived. So, my friend, astrophysics, astrochemistry, astrobiology, astromathematics, astrocomputing, astrostatistics. What else do you expect out of a subject? Probably the mother of all subjects. So, with the advent of technology, what we have realized, as if there is a new window that has opened up in our mind. And through that window, the picture of the universe that we are seeing, the amazing diversity, the amazing color, the amazing structure, the amazing chemistry, physics, is telling us, though we boast that we know a lot of things, but in this cosmic scale, in the quest of our cosmic consciousness, we hardly are a little objects, but with this tremendous power of our intelligence, which will help us probably one day to understand the cosmos. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Duari. Uh, what a fascinating talk it was, and I personally thoroughly enjoyed this. Right, thank so, you. So, uh, you had a full house that is. Uh, 500 people on Zoom and another more than 300 people listening to you on the YouTube live. And oh, that's a huge number for us. Beautiful. Thank you once again for this. Right. My name is Saurabh Mitra. Uh, right. I'm a faculty here at Surandranath College. Right. And I'll be conducting today's uh, question. Okay. Answer. okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. So first of all, uh, before starting the session, I must apologize to, to the participant that we have a very huge number of questions today. And while they are all equally good and and uh, equally important, but we cannot be able to take most of them uh, due to the uh, due to our time bound or time constraint. So uh, and of course a number of questions have been already answered by by the speaker during the talk. So if this is fine with you, Dr. Duari, uh, yeah, can you start sure, the sure. now? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, as you know that uh, this subject is very very intriguing, especially to the younger minds. So we always have questions like, uh, do aliens really exist? Or what is the possibility of building a colony in some distant planet? Or uh, do we believe in parallel universe or multiverse, time travel, etc.? So I, I am going to uh, ignore those as they are uh, far beyond the scope of today's lecture. Or, or if this is fine with you, or you can want to take those and make some comments on those. Yeah, if you, if you find them relevant and important, you can, mm -hmm. you can uh, pass it on and I'll try to do, that, do a justice. Okay, 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 I'll do that, fair enough. So uh, we asked the participant to put some questions in the registration. So I'll start with those first. So the first question is why Saturn is lighter than water? Saturn is lighter than water because it is mostly made up of gas. Actually, most of the Saturn's atmosphere is, uh, most of the Saturn's atmosphere is actually gas and there is no solid surface. If you if you can uh, make out right, so it is basically mostly hydrogen and other objects, also other materials also, and that is the reason it is lighter than water. Yeah. Okay, true. Yeah, and uh, the next question is that uh, why our solar system has only one star, while most of the planetary system has two stars? Because generally, because of the spinning of the nebula, which give birth to a stellar system, the mass is such that. When it is going round and round, two, two balls of gas become segregated and they start going spinning around each other and ultimately give birth, give birth to two stars. But in our solar system, the initial mass of the gas cloud was not enough to produce two stars. But Jupiter is a failed star. If the mass of Jupiter was 13 times that what it is today, it would have been another star. Oh, nice, nice. I didn't know that actually. Very nice as well. So uh, moving to the next questions, uh, 
Earth's magnetic field is gradually decreasing. Uh, so what will be the extreme result of this condition? Sorry, come again. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field mm. is gradually decreasing. So will that... See, uh, in, in our lifetime, definitely it will not do anything wrong. But okay. there are a lot of studies which says that it may flip. But when, how, nobody still knows the mechanism. The North and South Pole can flip over, but we get to read a lot of theoretical papers or the articles on that, but nobody knows for sure when can that happen or whether at all it will happen. Okay. Okay, the next questions, I, I, I'm moving a bit fast because we have plenty of questions and I really want to ask some of these uh, personally to you. So uh, uh, this is a very interesting question so we got that why are Venus and Uranus spinning in the wrong or opposite direction? Oh, this is because probably of the initial formation of the planetary system. At the initial stage when the planets were getting born, there were a tremendous number of collisions going on. And this collision slowly became less and less and ultimately the planets, they settled down onto their present orbit. But because of this collision, some of the planets may have got uh, opposite spin as well. And that have probably has given rise to opposite spinning motions that, we, that you just described. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, the next questions, which, uh, which many of the uh, students, I guess, they ask that uh, which telescope is best for students or amateur astronomers to observe night sky and galaxy? Uh, there is no fixed answer to that. There are so many types of telescope with so many varying degrees of magnitude and money and everything. One has to do a studious research going to the internet and try to find according to his or her likings. Yeah, sure, sure. That's true. That's true. Okay, so uh, moving on to the Zoom chat window questions, because we have there uh, plenty of questions as well. So yeah, uh, so this is a very good question, I guess. Uh, how scientists uh, give names to celestial bodies like asteroid, comets, stars, and other planets, which get which gets discovered? The, the, names, yeah. the names of these planets, asteroids, they come from different sources, sometimes mythological, sometimes from imaginary characters in our uh, fantasies, ideas, or literature. For example, the moons, you know, some of the moons of some of the planets, they are named after uh, characters of Shakespeare's novels. Whereas these things, these uh, planets, they are named after so-called gods as they were envisaged in the thousands of years back. So there is a colorful stories each planet each name has a colorful story behind it yeah that's true okay uh, so uh, moving to the next questions uh, someone asked uh, yeah this is a slightly pessimistic point of view i think <laughs> uh, then, uh, after the death of sun uh, what will be the fate of our planet Sell our planet oh, uh, coming in there is some disturbance after yeah, the... I just said, uh, after the death of the sun what will be the fate uh. of our solar system Death of the sun means death of much prior to that death of solar system. Because as the sun is becoming a red giant, much earlier than that, Mercury, Venus, Earth will cease to exist. They will all go inside the sun because sun is, has become so big. Yeah. And the other planets will also face the burnt. Some of them will get heated up or get, may evaporate. Some of evaporate a part of them, it may evaporate as some of them get may thrown away from the solar system by the tug of other objects in the sky. So nobody knows for sure what is the actual end. I cannot give you a graphic description of the death of the solar system, but as the sun dies, the solar system, which is which the main character being the sun, it also passes away much before than that. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, uh, we have another question about, uh, sir, tell me about Newton stars. Uh, if you want to take that, I mean, that's up to you, but this is... I mean, uh, my friend, neutron, neutron star is a different ball game than the, the subject that I discussed exactly, today. Exactly. But the point is that medium mass stars, heavier than sun, when they end their life, they explode. They call it supernova explosion. And the remnant at the core is basically called a neutron star. Okay. okay. So, uh, mm. So, uh, Dr. Duari, can I now take some questions from the YouTube live as well? Because yeah, yeah, sure, that, sure. Yeah, we had more than 300 people watching you there also. So yeah. uh, there are many questions that are coming there as well. So uh, moving to that. Okay. So uh, 
uh, just give me a second uh, yeah someone asked about that uh, the universe is expanding and the current phase of this expansion is accelerating so what causes this accelerating phase of the expansion nobody knows for sure what is the cause of acceleration but there is a general slowly building up conscious consciences that it is what is known as the dark energy not dark matter or vacuum energy which i myself if i'm not very sure what it actually means right. that uh, is that may be causing this repulsive sort of force which is making the universe accelerate faster and faster okay that's true that's true uh, uh there is another question from youtube live someone asked about how come scientists finds uh, uh, find out the honeycomb structure of or the other structure on sun's surface as the satellite can go close enough to sun yeah that's true but yes yeah. very true but if you take a photograph properly with proper filter you can see the granulations continuous as the bubbling of the surface of the sun and this bubble each bubble is actually nothing but the cells that i have just shown or described so these okay. granulations can actually be observed yeah okay and uh, so do you want me to continue or if you want another... another couple of question yeah yeah sure 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 so uh, the next question was that i mean why pluto is considered as as a dwarf planet i guess you have already answered this in your talk yes right? yes yes if you want to make some further comments on this or okay and uh, there are some questions like singularity in big bang but i am going to ignore that as well so uh, yeah that's a very nice question i guess i mean the i think uh, that can be our last questions because uh, i selected that that many students also want to know and i think you are the best person to share your insight on this that is what is what are the career opportunities for a physics student in the field of astronomy and astrophysics oh there is tremendous amount of opportunity after studying physics maybe bsc and msc you can directly join a phd program and get on to the get on to the board get on to the bus on uh, of astrophysics mm -hmm. not even physics if you even are an engineering graduate most of these engineering branches you can after your btech you can choose opt out for an astrophysics phd so and not only physics measuring in mathematics chemistry geology computer science you can still be a part of this fantastic initiative in astrophysics okay okay and uh, and, and i think that's a very good note to end today's question and answer session uh, thank you very much once again dr duari and thank you very much everybody for being uh, present today so uh now uh, okay just uh, coming to the ending session i have uh, a, a, a small announcement that the feedback link will be posted in the comment section in the zoom okay uh, just uh, let me just put it there first yeah, yeah so so you can please fill up the feedback uh, do fill up the feedback form within 12 noon tomorrow okay let me just yeah put it there okay so feedback link is there so uh, and the link will be activated just after the webinar so now i will hand over the mic uh, to our dbt star college coordinator dr suraj uh, dr suchanta chatterji for the ending session that is a uh, vote of thanks what do you do thank you dr mitra am i audible yes ma'am uh, so a warm and graceful afternoon to our honorable speaker valued viewers worthy members of surendrana college family all dignitaries and my most beloved students who have virtually gathered here for this outreach webinar organized by department of physics surendranath college under dbt star college strengthening scheme it's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks for today's fantastic presentation valued presence and all those real hard work behind the scene that made this webinar a reality On behalf of DBT Star family of Surendranath College, I extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest today, our esteemed speaker, Dr. Devi Prashad Duari, for gracing this occasion, sparing his most valuable time from his busy schedule. Ms. Dr. Duari, today you were heard uh, by about hundred uh, school students from seventy different schools. 
and about 600 graduate students from about uh, 50 college and universities all over India uh, through our Zoom and YouTube Live. We are really delighted to announce it. Hope your most eloquent and informative speech has definitely enriched them a lot to get the new view of the solar system in addition to their bookish geographic knowledge. My sincerest gratitude to you, sir, for gracing this occasion and sharing some most modern concept of cosmology with us. Thank you once again. Thank you. My heartfelt gratitude to DBT, Department of Biotechnology Government of India, for awarding us this fund. We are really indebted to them. I'm immensely thankful to our respected principal, Dr. Indra Nilkar, and our governing body for their inspiration and support. Thanks are due to all the faculty members of not only physics, but also the other three departments of DBT Star family for their tireless effort and enormous cooperation. I am really short of words for the involvement and dedication of all the dedicated members of our technical team for their willingness to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zone, even in this lockdown period. Kudos to all of them. Thanks are due to all my amazing colleagues, both teaching and non-teaching, who always stand by us, motivate and cooperate. I extend my most sincere love to our beloved students from different schools, colleges, and universities across India for their colorful presence. Their presence has made this webinar even more memorable, even more meaningful. Dear students, always remember, we the teachers value you and every moment you stay in the temples of learning. We really miss you these days. This webinar was solely meant for you and I hope you have enjoyed every moment of today's engaging lecture. Our best wishes are always with you. May you reach every height of success. Last but not the least, valued viewers, all the dignitaries, we owe you a lot for witnessing not only this program, but many more to make all our programs a resounding success. Starting from 15 June to 8 July today, Shurendra Nath College has organized successfully so far, 27 webinars, six under IQAC, 13 departmental, and seven under DBT Star College Training Scheme on a variety of topics. The best ones are there available in our YouTube channel for your perusal. And without your active participation, all those events could not have been possible. So a very big thank to all of you for being with us throughout this series of webinars. Now it's time to conclude, and I would love to do that with a Vedic verse. Ong madhu vata ritayate, madhu sharanti sindhabaha, madhirna santoshadhi, madhu naktam utoshaso, madhu mat parthi bangraja, Madhumana Banaspatihi, Madhumangas to Suryaha, Om Shantihi, Shantihi, Shantihi. After this pandemic, let everything be sweet and blissful once again. May again the wind carry all the sweetness. May the seas drip honey again. May there be no loss in your loving sweetness, Mother Nature. Let that eternal sweetness of yours penetrate the fog of all the morning processes and occupy our hearts. May there be the hearts be sweet to us. May the sky that holds the entire world be like honey to us. May the plants and sun be sweet and blissful to us. May peace prevail everywhere. At this difficult time, while fighting hard with this deadly coronavirus, let us all pray from this very platform for the eternal sweetness, eternal bliss, and eternal peace for the whole universe. And let there be peace very soon. 
all stay safe stay healthy take care thank you one and all 